All right. Uh, in uh, Westminster, London, in 1642, there was a guy named Thomas West, and he was fishing for salmon like four or five in the morning, and something big and heavy got tangled up in his net. So today we're going to discuss <laughs> the toadfish monster uh, from 1642. Hope you enjoy. All right, here's the final drawing. And uh, I used old school methods on this for an old school monster. You're going to see the process here. I'm uh, dipping a crow quill pen uh, into India ink. And then um, this is a really wonderful pen, which, uh, which is Japanese, which I ordered, special ordered. It holds a, a lot of ink and creates a beautiful, clear line. Um, and then I'm going to be doing some washes uh, with watered down ink and brushes. And you'll see it gives a really nice uh, uh, tonal quality. And I've toned the paper here already with uh, uh, a light wash of this India ink. So you can see there's already a gray tone uh, to begin with. Let me tell you a little bit about this monster. Uh, this creature was uh, f discovered in 1642, as I said, and um, it, it typifies in many ways uh, one of the uses of monsters, which is they were thought to be political or religious uh, omens or something that the gods or the fates were trying to tell human beings. So they were always interpreted, and there was always a question about, well, what does this thing mean? So in the ancient world, if if an intersex baby, what, what they called a hermaphrodite, was born, or a one-horned ram, or a conjoined twin, these were uh, thought to be sort of messages regarding to maybe future military campaigns, or the political wind, or general social welfare. Uh, monsters continued to function as portents throughout the medieval era, and then well into the modern. So one wonders how exactly this creature was interpreted. I couldn't find much. The, the way I discovered this creature was on a pamphlet uh, that was written in 1642, and I found the pamphlet in the Newberry Library in Chicago. And the Newberry Library has a wonderful collection of medieval and early modern maps and pamphlets, so I highly recommend visiting there. The pamphlet said, quote, a relation of a terrible monster taken by a fisherman July 5th uh, July 15th, 1642, and is now seen in King Street, Westminster. The shape whereof is like a toad, and may be called a toadfish. But that which makes it a monster is that it hath hands with fingers like a man, and is chested like a man, being near five foot long and three foot over the thickness of an ordinary man." End quote. So in this little presentation today, I'm going to probably be quoting from this pamphlet a lot. Between four and five o'clock in the morning, Thomas West was casting for salmon when the weight of his submerged net became unaccountably heavy. Thinking he had hit upon a thick school of fish, he happily struggled it to the surface, whereupon he drew back in horror. He saw in the net a fiend, not a fish, at the least a monster, not an ordinary creature. The hefty five-foot uh, creature seemed part giant toad and part man, capable of gulping with its wide toothy maw for prey but also able to paddle swim with humanoid arms. The posterior of the beast terminated with a whale-like tail fin. Here the author of the pamphlet breaks off from reporting and muses on the history and significance of this toadfish monster. Quote, now the coming up of this monster into the fresh river and so nigh the shore is more than remarkable, never any of this strange kind ever having been seen by any age before. End quote. One exception the reporter notes is that Pliny the Elder, uh, and here he's thinking of Pliny the Naturalist from the Roman period of the sort of first century common era, he did tell story of a kind of monster toadfish, but it lived far under the sea. Pliny, the author says, quote, never saw or heard of any taken upon any coast save one, which was in the year that Nero, that never sufficiently detested tyrant, was born. So here, the reference is to the Emperor Nero, who I think everyone knows was a horrific person, torturing and uh, basically killing right and left, even just for his own uh, entertainment and amusement. Pliny notes that uh, this correlation of the toadfish and Nero by saying, quote, monstrum precessit monstro, which is Latin for an omen precedes the monster, or you know, more poetically, a monster comes before the monster. 
Uh, and then the author goes on to say, Pliny plainly divined that its arrival was ominous, as indeed all histories do with constant consent maintain and write that all unusual births, either in men or brute creatures, in sea or upon land, especially out of their season, have ever been the forerunners and sad harbingers of great commotions and tumults in states and kingdoms, if not mournful her heralds of utter desolation. Uh, at the end of the pamphlet, the author crumbles into a stream of prayers beseeching the Lord for mercy. The precise significance of a particular omen or prodigy was often turned to some political purpose. So around the same time, really, well, a little bit earlier, the Reformation era, Catholics and Protestants used monsters to foretell the destruction of their opponents. So Martin Luther published a pamphlet in 1523 that discussed a monstrous cow born in Freiburg that year. The calf was born with a thick folded skin around its neck and back, making it appear as if clothed in a monk's cowl. In addition to a woodcut depiction of the, quote, monk calf, Luther's pamphlet included a woodcut of what he calls the Pope Ass Monster, part sea creature, part donkey, supposedly caught in the Tiber River a few years earlier. Now, these monsters were taken to be living symbols of the corruption and eventual decay of the Roman Church. The monk calf was like a typical Catholic monk, quote, pious and humble on the outside, but base and brutish on the inside. Luther claimed that two other monsters, one born without a head and another with inverted feet, constituted omens foreshadowing the death of Frederick the Wise. So these are just some of the political uses of monsters. Pamphlets were obviously put to great use um, in assassinating, uh, you know, uh, at least uh, propaganda-wise in assassinating your enemies. Here's the final image. I'm, I'm fairly happy with how this turned out. I've got uh, our protagonist, Thomas West, trying to escape the creature, which has emerged, emerged out of the water. There's some of the net on its back. Um, I made him a little larger than the pamphlet suggested, just for drama. But uh, I do think it captures a moment of a particular monster. We don't know what its political interpretation was, but it must have been uh, frightening. As for what it really was, I have no idea. There's no way to tell from just looking at the pamphlet uh, what this thing could have been. Could have been some kind of giant uh, bottom feeder. I really have no idea. That's the beauty of these stories. All right, I hope you enjoyed this monstrology tale. Come on back for more every week or so. I, I put something up here. And please hit the subscribe button. All right, take care.